Well, let's begin chapel service by singing Majesty, hymn number 215. And then uh, let's put your finger in hymn number 10. We'll sing How Great Thou Art also. Let's stand as we sing about the majesty and glory of His name. Sing with me. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, King of authority. Thee. How great Thou art, 
with me please the acrostic act serves us well sometimes as a guideline for prayer i wonder if you might use it as such right now the a is for adoration we've just worshiped him in his greatness would you pick out one other attribute or quality or characteristic of our lord and just in your heart adore him Anytime we begin to behold His character, we're made keenly aware of um, how far, far short we fall of um, who He is and what He is. The C is for confession. Did you identify one thing in your life right now that you need to agree with Him about? Something His Spirit has been prodding you to? A sin of commission, something you've done you need to repent of. A sin of omission, something that needs to be added to your life. As we embrace His forgiveness and His love in spite of us and our actions, we're drawn to thanksgiving. Rejoicing. The T is for thanksgiving. Would you just pause to thank Him? Maybe for two things. For His forgiveness and His love. Maybe there is something more tangible in your life that He's blessed you with this weekend, today. If for nothing else, the coolness of the weather outside. Let's thank Him together. The S, of course, is for supplication, asking. He stands ready to grant our request as we pray according to His will, and He bids us to ask and keep on asking, to seek and keep on seeking, to knock and keep on knocking. What do you need to ask Him for today? Lord, You hear the prayers of Your people. We offer them individually, Lord, but we know that they come up to You right now as a, as a sweet aroma collectively. It blows our minds to think that our praying, Lord, is something that is appealing to You, that is a sweet smell to You. And that excites us and it prompts us to worship You and to love on You. And Lord, that's what we're here for. Holy Spirit, You're welcome in this place. Your Word says, O oh God, that You inhabit the praises of Your people. So, Jesus, we just ask You to find a comfortable place in our midst right now and be found of us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Would you be seated? Good morning to you. Thank you for your faithfulness in being here. We welcome those who've just returned from Australia. I'm delighted to see them back in class and in chapel and uh, just hearing the good reports. And you'll be hearing more about that uh, as we go along in our classes. I am delighted this morning to introduce to you Dr. Bill Harden. Several years ago, but immediately before coming to the seminary, I had the privilege of uh, pastoring in the Picayune, Mississippi area. I was there for 18 months before coming here and beginning to teach and after I left there, First Baptist Church of Picayune called a new pastor. 
Sometime after that, uh, I was back up in the area, I believe, making a hospital visit. I went up there to see somebody that had been in my church when I was there that uh, was a friend, and I went by to visit with them and pray with them. It was on a Wednesday evening. And I decided as I was up there that I would just uh, take the time to worship uh, with some of the folks. I had good friends in the First Baptist Church of Picayune, and so I stopped by and slipped in the back of a Wednesday night worship service in the old chapel. They had to get a chair to put in the aisle for me to find a place to sit. And I sat there not knowing the preacher, not having met him, but watched him come to the pulpit and over the next little bit take a passage out of 1 Corinthians and unfold it before me. And I walked out of there not just seeing some friends and not just making a hospital visit, but on a Wednesday night that many times is taken for granted, I got a word from God. And from that day to this, I've had the highest regard and respect for Dr. Bill Harden, who's the pastor of that church, as he faithfully preaches and teaches the Word of God. And you talk to anybody in that church and you'll know that they hold him in high esteem for his faithfulness to God's Word and his leadership. But he didn't just unfold the text, he did it in a spirit of love and pastoral care that has been what has enabled those people to follow him and for them to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He's one of ours. He's a graduate of this institution, his Master of Divinity, went on to earn the Doctor of Ministry degree. And Dr. Harden, we are delighted uh, to have you today and look forward to hearing you uh, open up God's Word for us as we continue to worship. Thank you, Marvin for leading us, and we look forward to you and the others continuing to lead us in worship. Well, as we continue to worship, let's stay in a state of prayer and ask the Lord to change our heart. That's printed on your bulletin. Change my heart, O oh God, and we're going to sing I Surrender All. It's in number 275. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. My heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. The thing, you are the potter. You are the potter. This is what I pray. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. Well, when God changes our heart, we surrender everything to Him. Let's sing about that. Hymn number 275. Sing with me. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, to Him I freely give. I will ever. Savior, holy thine. 
surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me.
God bless you, Marvin. I didn't think I could be any more scared than I was till you just sang that song. <laughs> but I appreciate your influence and your leadership among us this morning. New Orleans Seminary has a special place in my heart, and I am thankful for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank Dr. Shaddix for the invitation. No doubt he went down his list of better preachers, and none of them were available, and so uh, he came to the end, and, and I am he, but I appreciate so much the privilege of being here today. After I got over the initial shock of knowing that I would come and preach in chapel, I began to wrestle a little bit with the text, the topic, the subject that I would give coverage to on this occasion. Obviously, the frustration and anxiety was very visible, for my wife saw it and she came in and, you know, your family has a way of just putting things in perspective for you. And so she said, sweetheart, what's the matter? And I said, well, I... Be honest, I'm scared about going to the seminary and preaching in chapel. Why in the world would you be scared to go preach in chapel? And I said, well, think about who's there. I said, only a handful of the students will know me, but many of the professors that I had are still there. And they remember what I was like then. And I remember them. And unless the student body has changed, you're probably similar to the Students that I came to seminary with, and I said, Honey, they're going to pick apart every phrase and everything that I've said. They're going to criticize every illustration and the, the theme and the flow of the message and, and the way I articulate and enunciate and, and all of that. And I'm just concerned over their evaluation. And she said, How's that any different from what I do every week? <laughs> and I said, Well, maybe you have something there. So I... I began to pray and ask the Lord for insight, wisdom into what I should say. I believe that He indeed gave the invitation, and He did, and He's planted a message in my heart. And it was up to me to discover it. And I don't believe God is a God who hides, but He's one who reveals His will and His ways. And so I began to pray, and I said, Lord, now you know who's there. And Lord, you know... I need to have something to say. And so I, I jotted down on a piece of paper some ideas for a sermon today. And I said, how about modern day occurrences of docetic Gnosticism? That'd be good, wouldn't it? Or how about the evolution of Calvinism? Whew, that'd get somebody's attention. Or the ordination of women in ministry. Now some of you are saying, you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. What in the world are you talking about all that stuff? I then said to the Lord, Lord, I want to preach on something that I know a little bit about. I want to, I want to preach on a subject that I have experience in. I, I want to preach on something that is near and dear to my heart. God, what would it be? And he said, why don't you preach on failure? Yeah, that's exactly what I said. I said, excuse me? You want me to preach on failure? Then I thought about who I'd be preaching to today, and I realized that some of you students might be vastly interested in this, and I'm assuming that not all of you are A students. But then God said, why don't you forget the ones to whom you preach and remember the one for whom you preach? Preach on failure. And as I thought through my own spiritual journey, I realized that I have fallen on my face and failed more times than I can count. As a matter of fact, I'm amazed that I don't look more like a hockey player with cuts and bruises and no teeth just because of the times that I've let the Lord down, I've let my family down, I've let myself down. I think it was Don Shula who used to say, you know, success is not forever, but neither is failure final. And that's a lesson that I think all of us need to learn. And I want to take you to a text in the Bible that I think illustrates this point very vividly. It's Exodus chapter 2. So I hope you, you have a copy of God's Word. You will open it with me there. And I want to read verses 11 through 15. We need an example of a person who failed and how God dealt with that individual in the midst of that failure. 
Look at what it says here in verse 11, Exodus 2. Now, it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that when he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you kill the Egyptian?" Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. What do you think of when I mention the name Moses? I hope you think of a great man. I hope you think of a great leader. I hope you think of a person of heroic proportions. Because that's who Moses was. We know him as the great liberator for the Hebrew people from Egypt. And we we know that he was granted an opportunity to appear, an appearance with Jesus and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration every Jewish home back then, even today perhaps, knows the story of Moses and what a great man of stature he was. But I want to remind you, before he was a great man, he was just a man. A group of tourists were going through a small village in Italy, and as they passed through, they saw this elderly gentleman leaned up in a chair against a storefront. And one of the tourists went over and said, Sir, could I ask you a question? He said, Of course. The tourist asked, Have there been any great men born in this village? The old man thought for a minute, and then he said, Nope, just babies. (laughs) Isn't that God's way? He doesn't bring us into this world with all the resources and wisdom and preparation that we need to accomplish all that He has for us, but He allows us to be born vulnerable and weaklings in this world, and He allows us the opportunities to fail along the way until we achieve the success that He has desired for us. I believe what was said of Jeremiah could be said of Moses, and that was, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. I sanctified you and set you apart. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The same thing could be said for you and for me. God has a plan for our lives. God has great dreams. God has goals out there that He wants to us, us to achieve. And I, I hope that you're desirous to meet those goals. I hope that's something that you want in your life. But I want to assure you along the way that you're probably going to experience failure. Now, hopefully failure for us is going to be like catching the flu. It's not something we ever intend to do, but when it happens, we take our medicine and we pray for better days ahead. Failure is a great teacher like experience. But I'm here to tell you experience is also a difficult teacher. You know why? Oftentimes you have to take the exam before you're taught the lesson. And I think that was the case with Moses. This incident in Moses' life, when he looked out and and saw this Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and Moses intervened and wanted to separate the two and reconcile their differences Moses' anger turned and he vented himself as he lashed out against the Egyptian and he killed him there. I believe that this was Moses' first attempt at liberating Israel from Egypt. And God allowed him to walk through this experience before he came back as the great man we know him to have been. Now, what lessons do we learn from this experience in Moses' life? Number one, I hope you'll see it. 
will never be able to achieve God's goals for our lives based on human strength. You see, Moses thought he knew who was supposed to deliver Israel. He thought he was supposed to do it. Did you see it there in the text as it says when Moses saw this incident of the Egyptian beating the Hebrew that he looked this way and that way? It's an idiomatic expression that almost says he looked north and south and east and west. He looked every which way but up. He didn't realize that God was watching. He didn't even acknowledge God as a part of that opportunity. He just said, here is something that I see needs to be done, and by George, I've got the strength and I've got the ability, and I'm going to go to it, and I'm going to do it. Acts chapter 7 says, this is the sermon of Stephen that got Stephen killed, by the way. I'll steer clear of that text. <laughs> you better too. Stephen's preaching, and as he preaches, he brings Moses in as an illustration. And he says there in Acts chapter 7 that Moses was mighty in word and deed. That word mighty there that he used means strong. It means he was a powerful man in stature and in influence and in wisdom and word. I'm here to tell you, if there was anybody who thought that they could deliver Israel, it probably would have been Moses. Think about it. He grew up in Pharaoh's court. He was probably next in line to ascend to the throne and become a pharaoh over Egypt himself. He ate the finest foods of the day. He was educated among the best. He was probably in shape. Moses was well received not only by the Egyptians because he grew up in Pharaoh's court, but also by the Israelites because he himself was a Hebrew. Josephus says, that Moses was the kind of man that when people saw him in public, they could not take their eyes off of him until he left their sight. Wow! That's who Moses was. Moses had abilities. Moses had talents. Moses had wisdom and prowess. He had ingenuity and all of those things that we desire and that we see in each other. But I'm here to remind you today that if you're going to be God's man and God's woman and you're going to achieve all the things that God has in store for you, you'll never be able to do it on your own strength. You must acknowledge Him. You must allow Him to accomplish through you what He wants accomplished. You know what our tendency is? Our tendency is to fail to make the difference between human talents and spiritual giftedness. Now, if you've been in church for very long, you know what this is like. As a pastor of the church, people always bring people up to me and introduce them. And, you know, sometimes they're new in our church and I don't know them very well. And they'll, they'll bring them by and they'll say, Pastor, do you know who this is? And I'm like, well, well no, I don't. T tell me about this fellow. This is Mr. Jones. Like I'm supposed to know from that who he is. Well, who is Mr. Jones? He's a CPA in our community. He's well respected. And then they'll whisper, he needs to be on the budget and finance committee. Somebody will bring a lady up, you know, and they'll introduce him, and, and they'll say, this is Sally. And she teaches third grade over at the elementary school. And then when she walks off, they'll say, don't you think she'd make a great sixth grade Sunday school teacher? I don't know that. Somebody brought the fellow up to me one time, you know, and they said, do you know what he used to do? I said, what? He was a referee in the NFL. And I said, and I suppose you want him on the personnel committee. <laughs> Why is it that we fail to recognize the difference between human strength and spiritual giftedness? God knows there's a difference, and sometimes He allows the two to mix with each other, but oftentimes they are opposite extremes. Moses, he had strength, he had ability on his own. But it was not that strength that God wanted to use. It was not Moses by himself that God would allow to free Israel. God wanted to do something bigger and better. I hope you never get over the grace of God. Never. 
What amazes me most of all is God's willingness to use us in spite of the fact that we are flawed individuals. I have a lady in our church who makes quilts. And the quilts that she makes are made only from discarded material. You ever known anybody that did that? She'll take the material that other seamstresses throw away or other shops discard and say, you know, we have this much left off the boat and we don't want it. So they'll throw it away. She goes by and she collects those. Or sometimes she buys it at discounted prices and she puts the quilt together. And then she'll say, I use this as an example of how God uses our lives. He never throws us away. But He makes us something bigger than we are of ourselves And we're useful in His kingdom's work, but we're useful as we give ourselves to Him and say, Lord, what I am, I am nothing. John 15, 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And we say, Lord, if you'll only use me, I'd be grateful. I'd be honored. You remember Gideon? Judges chapter 6. How Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Don't casually read over that. that. That is such a hilarious passage to me. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You press grapes in a wine press. And as he's down there hiding from the enemy, the angel appears and says, Hail, O mighty man of valor! Now, I think God had one of the most wonderful senses of humor when he sent that angel. Gideon was not a mighty man of valor. He was a coward. He was hiding. He was down there trying to get food for his family and did not want the enemy to see him and come kill him and take his food and ultimately take his family. And so he's down there in the wine press. The angel says, I have a job for you. Oh, what's that? I want you to wage war against the Midianites. You will defeat them. Oh, I can't do that. I'm just me. I want you to do it, Gideon. Well, how do I do it? Well, bring together all the men in Israel and we're going to find out who can fight. You know the story. You're seminary students. You do read the Bible. Oh, those men showed up 30,000 in number. Gideon said, all right, let's go. God said, time out. You got too many men. What? What do you mean too many men? What? Have you counted the Midianites lately? You have too many men. Gideon, if you go to wage war with Midian now, you will win. You will win and your people will be able to say that they did it on their own strength, Gideon. I don't want that. I want them to know that I've done it. You see the scenario and how God dwindles that army of 30,000 down to 300 and then Gideon shaken in his boots but with a confidence and a peace of God that if God in fact has led them to do it that God will give them the victory and God says now you're able to go Gideon and I will provide the victory and they will know beyond a shadow of a doubt who's given them the victory they didn't do it I did it You see, you can't sing on Sunday to God be the glory and under your breath mumble as long as I get the credit. It's always got to be, Lord, I am Yours and Yours alone. Make me. Use me. In spite of me, Lord, do something bigger than myself. Is that who you are? Did you hear little Laurel Wilkinson's comment Sunday night? after she won the gold medal in the 10-meter platform diving competition in Australia. All the obstacles she'd overcome with an ailing parent, almost not qualifying, breaking three bones in her foot, having to wear that boot up those steps until she got up on the platform to dive. And as she dove in the first few rounds, she was, you know, seventh or eighth or way down there on the list. And they were saying, oh, I don't know if a medal is within her reach or not. And then all of a sudden, as the other divers, the Chinese and the connect, you know, you never pray for somebody to fail unless they're the opponent, right? And so the Chinese and, and the Canadians begin to dive and they begin to mess up and people begin to say, oh, what's this? And Laura would go up on the platform and she would dive and she would nail it and she'd get a good score until all of a sudden at the end of the, the program she'd won. 
And as they stuck that microphone in their face and they talked about their emotion and their charisma and how much they loved this kind of competition and how she overcame, they said to her, how do you summarize your experience tonight? Do you hear what she said? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Praise God. You want to achieve something great for God, then you allow Him to do it through you because you realize that the task and the assignments that you're given, they're much bigger than us. If they get accomplished, He has to do it through us. Point number two. If you're going to achieve God's goals, you must understand that God's goals can never be achieved on a human schedule. Again, I go to Acts chapter 7 as Stephen is preaching. Do you know what he says there in verse 23? He says in Acts 7 that Moses was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. Do you know what it says in verse 30, Acts chapter 7? Another 40 years had passed when God revealed Himself in the burning bush to Moses. Now, I can understand missing God's schedule a day or two, but we're talking about 40 years. And I know the debate over 40. You know, well, maybe it wasn't 40 years. But let's suppose just for a moment that 40 years is 40 years. Moses missed it. Not only did he think he knew who was supposed to liberate Israel, he thought he knew when Israel was to be liberated. And may I gently and lovingly remind you that we don't always know God's schedule. And is it possible that God allowed Moses to walk through this experience and to have this failure in order to convince him that there was a better way and a better time? Sometimes our failures are lessons in that, in that way. God wants to show us, hey, this is something I want you to achieve. This is something I ultimately want to happen, but it will not happen right now. You know what one of the most difficult verses in all the Bible is for me? I'm going to tell you. You're going to be disappointed, but I'm going to tell you. 1 Corinthians 3, 5. You say, what does that say? Paul is writing. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. That's a difficult thing for me. Because he is illustrating the process of time and how ministry is accomplished. And as I look at that, I'm thinking, well, we all want to harvest. We don't want to plant. We don't want to cultivate. We want to harvest. But, but what we do every single time we minister is we are plugging in with other partners in ministry and we are capitalizing on what they have done and sometimes even the benefits of what we are doing are not visible and we walk away and say, what's happened here? Have I failed? Have I not done what God wanted me to do? I remembered not long ago I I had left the church, well, it's a good while ago now, but I had left the church and the pastor of the church that they had called after I left, he called me and he was asking me about something just trivial and off the cuff, you know. And and then he got around to telling me what was happening in that church. And he said, did you know so-and-so made a profession of faith two months ago? I said, no, I didn't. He said, did you know so-and-so's family joined the church uh, last week? I said, no, I didn't. We hung up the phone and I said, Lord, why didn't you let them join while I was there? I was the one that witnessed to them. I was the one that sacrificed my time, made all the effort, and put forth the energy. I was the one that did all of that. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. God has a schedule, sometimes we may not see it. But He wants to remind us that in the midst of failure, maybe He has a different plan and a different timetable in mind. You see it? Point number three. If we're going to achieve God's goals for our lives, we must understand that God's goals will not be achieved by human standard. A standard is a unit of measurement. 
And what I mean by that is that God doesn't see our failures necessarily in the way that we see those failures. You see, Moses thought he knew who was supposed to deliver Israel. He thought he knew when Israel was to be liberated. He even thought he knew how Israel was to be liberated and freed from Egyptian bondage. He was to be God's man, but a different time in a different way. Did you notice as we read through verse 15, it says that when Moses fled for his life, that he went to Midian and that he sat down by a well. Do you know where Midian is? Sure you do. You've taken Dr. Cole's course. It's in the Sinai Peninsula. It's in the desert. It's in the very place where Moses would go get the Hebrews and take them back and they would spend 40 years wandering around before they would ever claim the Promised Land. The interesting thing to me is that the writer would even tell us he sat down by a well. And if I could spiritualize just for a moment, I would talk about how that well was a very valued resource in that day, had provided much desired water that sustained life. Before Moses ever got to the burning bush, he had to pass by this well. Because as he sat down there, he would meet his wife who would introduce him to her father and become his father-in-law who would give him a job, who would give him sheep to tend in the desert. And out there tending those stinking, smelly sheep, Moses would contemplate where he'd been, what he'd done, and how he'd failed. And then we come to Exodus 3 where God would reveal Himself in the burning bush. And back there in Exodus 2, Moses would say, I am somebody, I can do something here. And in Exodus 3, God says, Moses, I want you to go back and free Israel. Moses says to God, Who am I? I ain't nothing, God. God had to get him from being somebody to being nobody before God could use him. And the very circumstances that you think are going to break you are the very circumstances that God will use to make you. On July 1st, 1998, I resigned as pastor of First Baptist Picayune. Sure did. You see, if there's one thing that no one could have ever prepared me for, it's the number of deaths that I'd have to deal with as pastor of that church. I'd pastored in churches before coming to Picayune, and I had uh, five or six funerals a year, and and I thought that was just typical. That's the way that, uh, you know, I would handle deaths and funerals. I'm in my fifth year in Picayune, and I've averaged every year between 35 and 40 funerals. That's right. You see, you just go from one sickness and one bad diagnosis and one sad situation to another. 1998 was the year we lost Billy K. Smith. July of that year, or March of that year, we lost Dr. Tom DeLauder, who was another professor of New Orleans Seminary. Their families were hurting. They were grieving. And Beth Ball is the adopted daughter of Dr. Ms. DeLauder. And Ms. DeLauder was to have surgery. I was in Slidell at the hospital and I was with Beth for that surgery. And the doctors had told her, Beth, we don't know if your mother can survive this surgery or not. But she's got to have it because without it she will die. So you can imagine the trauma and the stress of this precious lady, dealing with the death of her father, now facing the possible death of her mother. And so I was with them there in the hospital, and while I was there, I I just had opportunity to talk with Beth about the situation, and, and I allowed her to vent some of her concern and worry and anxiety. And it was all beginning to build up within me, and then all of a sudden, I don't know what we did before we had pagers and cell phones, but my pager went off. 911, well, I knew what that was, call the office and call it now. 
So I called the office and they said, I hate to have to tell you this, but Mr. B.M. Stone is at the other hospital in Slidell and he's just went code blue. You need to get over there quick. So I graciously bowed out of that situation with Beth, got into my car, and as I'm driving over to the other hospital, my phone rings. I pick it up and the secretary said, just wanted you to be prepared, Mr. Stone has died. I hung the phone up. Mr. B.M. Stone, a wonderful fellow, funny, loving, gracious. He was the only member of the church who wrote me a letter before I became their pastor. And who in that letter said to me, point blank, Bill, as long as you never do anything immoral or unethical, I will always support you. That's the kind of man he was. When I hung my phone up in the car that day, I said to God, God, I quit. I resign, I'm throwing in the towel, I'm checking out, it's not fair, no one congregation ought to have to suffer the way this congregation ought to have to suffer, and I ought not to have to be their pastor and go through this with them. I I meant it. I was serious. I went to that hospital and I had to suppress my anger to deal with that situation as I ministered to that family, had prayer with them and helped them get in their cars and head back to Picky, and this was on a Wednesday. As I made my way back to the church, we had people run around all over the place. We served Wednesday night supper. I went into my office and I shut the door and I said, God, unless you change my mind, I'm going in there and I'm resigning tonight. I did not know what the Bible study was on that night. I prepared those Bible studies two and three weeks ahead of time. and I sat down and I opened my Bible and it just so happened I was teaching through the parables of Luke. It was the winter Bible study that year. And the Bible study for that night was from Luke 18, where in verse 1 the NIV says, And Jesus taught His disciples this parable saying, You ought to always pray and never give up. I shut my Bible. I looked at the Lord and I said, Why'd you do that? And you know, he came and he said, Bill, go ahead. I'll let you resign. But I just want to tell you, when you resign, I will provide another pastor for this church and he won't quit. I'm here to tell you there was a fresh wind of excitement and enthusiasm that stirred my heart that day, ladies and gentlemen. And I have looked back upon that as a pivotal experience in my ministry where I was honest with God and He was honest with me. And He said, go ahead, I'll let you fail, but I won't let it be final. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing this, that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Father, I give You thanks and praise for this opportunity today. Take each one of these special people and use them mightily in Your service as we make ourselves available to You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.